Welcome to Bowties in Business, where a fashionable nerd and knowledge meet. Regardless of whether your career is just starting, steady, or stalling, join me and a collection of business and thought leaders who are experts in their field as they share their decades of first-hand real-world experience from the ground floor, the executive suite, and every corner of the business world. Thanks for listening today. We appreciate you being here and taking the time. I'm your host, Tim Kubiak. And our topic today is being more effective, more efficient, and more productive. As always, we've added helpful links in the show notes so you can find the materials we talk about there. And as always, there's going to be bonus written content available in the podcast section of timkubiak.com. That is T-I-M-K-U-B as in boy, I-A-K.com. We hope you like what you hear. If so, please subscribe to Bowties in Business on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify. Plus, you can find me on a host of other podcast applications. If you want more information or just like the occasional dog picture to go with your business info, you can find us at Bowties and Business on Instagram and Facebook and on Twitter at Bowties and Biz, B-I-Z. As always, feel free to stalk me at timkubiak.com and on Twitter and LinkedIn just as at Tim Kubiak. With that, I'd like to introduce today's guest, Dorinda Haskell. With more than 30 years of sales and training experience, Dorinda has crafted and developed sales teams from New Zealand to New York, from small to medium business through enterprise-sized teams. She's had a hand in cultivating the careers of literally hundreds of sales professionals. She has a diverse skill set and is a passionate and compassionate trainer. She was among the first to implement SAP on a global scale, doing so with an eye towards the business impact and the customer's experience. She worked to develop a program that when the system went live, both internal and external customers had successful day one experiences, the first time and every time. No career is all wins. And Dorinda helped her team learn and eventually see the humor and the outcomes of the less than successful sales calls as well. She's here to offer her real world experience, tips and tricks to get to the table. She's a great coach, a developer of talented people, and she's taken some of the most timid sales wannabes and help make them some of the most successful, top-performing sales professionals at their companies. Now, a personal story. Once upon a time, in a world that was full of M&A and people were changing companies rather rapidly, I was locked with my CEO of the time in a small room with Dorinda and two folks from her sales teams. They were pitching for a business as we locked a product expansion. She didn't know it at the time, but they already had the business. The meeting was simply a formality. So they pitched like mad, did an amazing job. And at the end of it all, when we told them, yep, they want our business, she looked across the table at me and asked me, where do I know you from? Big companies are strange things and strange places at times. And I laughed and I said, I had been a peer of hers that actually ran a sister division in another city post acquisition for a couple of years. She had in fact had given me the best pitch I'd seen from anyone in that company ever other than a founder. It was better than any of mine were at that time, and a fast friendship was formed. With that, nearly two decades later, we're here working together. Her theme is it's all about prep work, perseverance, and nonstop desire to get it done. I'm proud to have Dorinda as a co-author in a forthcoming book we have called The Unnatural Salesman, and some people just write a book and hit print. We've literally spent a decade working and reworking the content and the training material to make sure it's absolutely dead on and delivers real world actionable value. With that, please welcome Dorinda to the show. And Dorinda, thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Tim. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, this is a lot of fun for me. So we're going to have a good time today, like always. Oh, um, cool. I'm, I'm just going to do this as a conversation, right? And, and I know that you're really focused and you've always done a great job at having your team have their days lined out, have their tasks done, stay, stay on task, stay managed. You know, when you watch your teams closely, in a lot of ways, managers don't. So with that, you know, we're going to talk about the productivity part of the world today. So let's start with something that probably seems obvious, but with so many apps and devices and even people consistently clamoring for our attention, how does a person begin to get organized in a digital world? That's an excellent question. And I think that the answer comes from a variety of different places, frankly. I think it comes from what you're most comfortable with. And I will tell you, I'll take that from what I'm most comfortable with. And believe it or not, in my digital world, I get organized with a pad and a piece of paper and a red pen. 
I say specifically a red pen because that makes it stand off the paper very, uh, whatever I'm jotting down makes it stand off the paper very, very comfortably. And it keeps me on task because I actually can see, I'm very visual, so I actually can see what needs to be done and it gives me the opportunity to move things around as I need to and move, move and shake as the day goes on, depending on what's happening, priorities are gonna change, et cetera. Just keep adding to this list of paper in red pen that I have next to me. And at least I then can cross things up at the end of the day and really see accomplishments that way. Again, I do find that a good old piece of paper, just a simple lined pad of paper next to you makes all the difference. It gives you the opportunity to actually see accomplishments. I personally find in this digital world with so many things coming at me, all day long from so many different directions, you really can step back at the end of the day and say, wow, what did I accomplish today? Because so many things were going on. You look at that piece of paper and you see things that you either crossed off as complete or checked off as complete. And it really feels very, very satisfying. You know, and, and that's a fantastic point because so often, you know, I, I use the phrase a lot when coaching salespeople, there's no victory laps anymore. Everyone gets a deal, and then next, what have you done for me lately? And the world's always been that way a little bit, but there's literally no sense of accomplishment anymore. And, and physically seeing what you've done in a day and striking it out and, and knowing that it's off the list, that does feel great. Absolutely. It's extremely rewarding. And it really makes you sort of slow down and just take a look and, and take that moment to savor the fact that you got something done. Because you're right, Tim, we all jump from one thing to the next so fast because we think that we've got to get through this marathon as fast as we humanly can. And you don't stop to, uh, to even acknowledge an accomplishment or to even just think of something, the next step that you need to take. If you're constantly running at that speed, things get skipped. Yeah, I, and that's one of the things when I went on my journey and changing what I was doing and how I approached my business, you know, last fall, I realized I was scheduled back to back. I had no time between meetings. I was doing my follow up at eight at night and at five in the morning because literally I was booked every hour of the day. And, and one of the things I realized pretty quickly is that's a great way to burn out. And the other thing is it's a great way to not realize what you've actually accomplished. That's absolutely true. And it's funny that you just said that. One of the things that I've always coached to, and I am a deep believer in this, I'm probably the only person you know that will start a meeting. First of all, start it promptly. I don't care. I call a meeting for a specific time. We're going to start them because the people that have the courtesy and the foresight to show up on time deserve that. But more than that, if you stop your meetings or you stop your tasks at 15 minutes to the hour, it actually gives you a minute to recoup, regroup, and even use the restroom if you need to. That's unheard of in modern business culture. How dare you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. We all think that we just have to be back to back and have meetings from the crack of dawn and be in the gym talking and in the grocery store talking and everywhere that you go. Sometimes you just need to have a little bit of quiet time, even if it's just to get into your own head, just to chill a little bit and just, just to breathe. Yeah. Last year, I, I actually broke a rule that I had had for the two years prior. And that was, I had, I called it Nemo, no email on planes. I love it. And, and so I unsubscribed from the email networks, right? That were 40 bucks a month. And I, and I flew a couple hundred thousand miles a year for years. And I started using that time to read books. And to, it's funny you talk about writing with a pad and paper to write just on a notebook. And I, I've got a notebook for literally everything. I've de-digitized my life. And I, my kids were ragging on me on Twitter a few weeks ago about their OCD because I had laid out an entire presentation and colored post-it notes with each post-it color being a different thing. And I've literally going to, in my business, um, different colored paper. Right, I had yellow papers for one type of projects, pink papers for a different project, green papers for another type of thing, and every different task associated with five or six different parts of my business has its own color paper. So I know I'm looking for a yellow sheet right now. Podcasts are yellow, so you know all my notes, everything for the podcast are done on yellow paper. I think that's excellent. That's a fabulous way to be organized. And I think a lot of people, if they've taken anything from this chat that we've been having, take that because that's pretty darn brilliant. 
you, you know, and it, it, it literally, the, I joke about being OCD and I don't, I am in certain things very OCD. And, and that was just one of the things that I did when I was staring at, I have different colored notebooks. So if you ever see me in an airport or never ever see me in public, ask to see my notebooks. I will have a purple one, I'll have a black one, I'll have a gold one. And I can tell you what every single thing is for and they, they never mix. <laughs> so I just, I'll just add that you have saved yourself, I'll just guess here and say probably an hour a day in looking for things because you know exactly where they are because of that system that you've set up. That system works for you and that's exactly the key here. If you can come up with a system of organization that works for you, then you can work your system and be successful at it. You find that you're a whole lot calmer now going into meetings and getting prepped for things versus scattered around trying to find a million and one things on your desk. Let's face it, Jim, I know what your desk looks like. I know it can get a little bit um, nasty. So I think that's a pretty cool idea that you would be able to put your hands on something almost instantaneously based on your color-coded method. Bravo, that's excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you. While we're talking about, you know, methods, how, how would you recommend a person go about prioritizing their activities? I certainly think that you got to think about the best, your most productive time of the day, the day that's best, the best part of the day for you. For me, that's very early in the morning. It's not unusual for me to have my alarm go off at 4.45 in the morning. I'll get up, I'll have a, a, some sort of a workout, which will have a cup of coffee or two and really get going. And then I will do the things that are most important to me. I like to call them my veggies. It can be my veggies first. Not only because I love my vegetables and to get them done and out of the way, it's very, very rewarding. But you can take the things that are most important to you and cross one or two of them off of your list before lunchtime, you will feel absolutely accomplished. So for me, those are the brightest hours of the day. I tend to slow down a little bit in the afternoon, as do many people, right? Around four o'clock, you're really looking for a Snickers bar or something to pick you up for another 90 minutes or so in the course of the day. Get the most important things done and you will feel rewarded all day long. So that, that leads me to a couple of questions I hadn't prepared here. A lot of the productivity people I've heard on other podcasts, some of the experts I've read, talk about a capsule wardrobe. Do you have any thoughts on that one? A capsule wardrobe? So basically, sort of the Steve Jobs thing, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. He wore the same black outfit every day. And and I will tell you, mm -hmm. I'm a child of the 80s, right? Ivan Boski, yes, he was a criminal. But <laughs> he wore a black suit with a white shirt and a black tie every day. He had all the same black suits in his closet, mm -hmm. all the same white shirts. He didn't have to think about it. It's funny because now I'm hearing a lot of people say, you know, lay your clothes out in advance, have a capsule wardrobe. And literally yep. my chiropractor right, has talked to me about this. He wears the same outfit on the same day every week. There's no I'm, variation. I'm very guilty of exactly the same thing um, because it makes it no brainer. It's part of my routine, right? I know that on Friday I wear jeans, on Monday I wear black jeans, on Tuesday I wear dark blue jeans, on Wednesday I wear lighter color jeans, and I know all of the stuff that go with it and all of the accessories that I need to put them together. It is absolutely, it's part of my routine now. Unless, of course, there's a business meeting that I throw in my little business outfit, which happens to be black pants and a black blazer. Makes it very versatile, makes it very easy to get around. So it makes a lot of sense. You know, there's, we're all sort of trying to streamline the way we do things, right? To minimize the way we do things. I have absolutely found that capsulizing things like that, if that's such a word, capsulizing, for doing that to my life has made a huge, huge difference. And for those of you that are into CS, I'm that freak that's got about 90 pair of shoes. I match the shoes to it as well. <laughs> See, I have fought the capsule wardrobe like mad. Obviously, I do the bow tie thing every Tuesday. You know, I have a bow tie basically for every week of the year and then maybe some, you know. But outside of that, you know, I am dark jeans, dark pants, black shoes, black belt. But I, I do like my shirt colors and I still love my bow ties. <laughs> right. Well, and you, you, but you've taken the guesswork out of most of it by doing that. And that makes it a little bit more simple. You know, yeah. I think the more we become digitized and the more we, that we can achieve 9,000 extra things in the course of a day, the more we need to think about the things that we can control. And that, frankly, is one of them. Yeah, there was actually, it was uh, Dave Asprey who 
runs Bulletproof Radio. And his books was one of the books I read last fall. And, you know, one of the things, one of the exercises is early in his Game Changers um, book was, you know, keep track of your decisions every day and and just do it for a couple of days and all the decisions you make and then eliminate how many of those you can. And it was stunning how many nominal decisions people make or I made. I won't, I won't speak for anyone else. You know, I knew I was having two, you know, 16 ounce cups of coffee, each with two Splendas in it every morning. But everything outside of that was a decision all the way through from personal to, you know, what time to get to the airport to everything. So I, I literally standardized everything. I will get to the airport this far in advance. Always, I will do this. I will spend this much time. It, it, it was an amazing change just taking all those variables out. Did you find that you found that your day was a whole lot calmer than it had been? It was a lot less frenzied. I look around me now and I see all of these people just running in circles. Go to the gym on any given weekday morning. People are in such a huge hurry because they got to get here and they got to get there and they got to do this, that, and the next thing. If you can standardize on things exactly like what you're saying, Tim, that takes a lot of the guesswork out of your day. And I'm willing to go out on a limb here and say most people will truly find more hours in the day to be more productive and to be more um, rewarding as a result of that. We're not crazy and frenzied all day long. Those are the things that you can control. Those are the things that are in your control to control. So why wouldn't you? Yeah, so so one of the things I added was actually, it's really new age, right? But I actually added a, um, again, it came out of that book, was um, the first thing I do is make coffee. And anyone who knows me knows I live on coffee. So when you're looking for Snickers bar, I want a quad espresso. But the next thing I did is I actually, when I am home or when I'm in a hotel, and somebody really made fun of me over the weekend for this, but I actually set a timer and, and I sit down and I, and I set a five minute timer and I essentially do a five minute meditation every day. And my, my, my journal is purple. And then at the end of that, I wrote what I thought about because I don't go into it with an agenda and the three things I have to accomplish that day in my business, right? And they're not personal things. The, the, the meditation may go anywhere, but the three things that I write down at the end are I've got to do X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. right? And, and that really has helped me and, and I've become almost militant about defending my early day schedule. My personal best creative time is between 5.30 and 8.30 in the morning. So I, I have literally gotten to the point where I don't speak to anyone before 8.30 in the time zone I'm in. I just don't. I get up, I'm creating content, I'm writing workbooks, you know, I'm, I'm delivering, you know, assessments for clients. I'm thinking about how I'm going to coach individual A or B on a problem they have, and that's my creative time. And then after 8.30, I do what the rest of my day and my business requires, but it has made a huge difference, frankly, my personal happiness, right? And, and sense of order and sense of control. And I am violently defending that time. Hey, can you get on a call at eight? Nope, I can't. I can get on a call at 8.30, can't get on a call at eight. That makes perfect sense to me. Tim, what I'm hearing you say is that you're getting your veggies in first thing in the morning when you are most alert, brightest, and most willing to do the hard work. Yeah. Yeah. I That's also exactly have the name of the game. I have the two o'clock rule. Have I ever told you about that? No, I'd love to hear that. So, so I, I came up with the two o'clock rule when I was still in the corporate world and it was actually three roles ago in the corporate world. And the answer is, is at after 2 PM in the time zone I'm in, if I think I'm going to say no and be unreasonable and the reason I'm not wanting to do something or pursue an option or consider a viewpoint, I literally had all my staff condition. I'll invoke the two o'clock rule. And by the way, you can too. So if you're talking to me and I know that I say no to things more in the afternoon, even if they're great ideas. So I will literally tell people it's two, it's after two o'clock. I'm invoking the two o'clock rule. Come talk to me at eight 30 tomorrow morning. I'll put it in the calendar. We can sit down. I want to hear it all over again because I'm just not open-minded right now. And I've literally had people turn to me and it's fair. And they've said, you know what? I'm calling the two o'clock rule because you're saying no, but you're not hearing what I'm saying. And, and I don't think you're really getting it. And sometimes my decisions would stand, but sometimes also I'd go, 
oh crap, I was totally missing that. You're, you're absolutely right. But you know, and they had a brilliant idea and sometimes you met in the middle, but it was a rule I created in literally when I would get a new staff member, a new direct report, I'd say, okay, you need to know about the two o'clock rule. So you talked about starting meetings on time. I run Lombardi time. If you're not 15 minutes early, you're five minutes late. Anything after two o'clock, I, I reserve the right to invoke the two o'clock rule on and defer to the next morning. I think that's excellent because then that gives everybody a time to step back, think about what's actually needing to be done, think about perhaps what was already said in that meeting, and really you can just reframe it and make it work for all parties involved. I think that that's an excellent rule. I really like that. Yeah, so we'll we'll have to go a little deeper on that one another time, and you know maybe I'll do a little write up on that as well because it's nothing I've ever talked about or written about. It's just something I've done with my teams. I think it's an excellent idea, and I think that everybody who listens to these podcasts and let's face it, they get bigger and bigger every week. That would be an incredibly valuable tip. I think, frankly, that a lot of little tips and tricks that people like you and I who have been around the block more than once really can share with some people who also are very seasoned and certainly people who are coming up to make this world a better place. Those are the kind of tips and tricks that make people very successful. I know that I personally have carried many tips and many tricks with me over the years. Things that I learned from some of my very first early mentors, yourself included. Yeah, you know, that's very nice of you to say. Talking about that, I'm just a guy that carries a bag, right? At the end of the day, I don't care. You know, everybody's in sales, in my opinion. And I also believe eventually everyone will buy from me. So it's maybe a little bit of a unicorn there. When, when you look at efficiency and priorities, does your approach have to vary if you're in sales? That's a great question. I think um, really when you look at the corporate structure or small or medium business structure, this, any stru business structure, everybody's in sales. And there's so many different reasons that somebody would buy from a particular company. Particular company. It might be because they like Susie in finance and the way she asks for money. Or it might be because they like Josie in, um, I don't know, in, in the legal department because of the way she can help them structure a contract. Or maybe it's because they really do just like the and the things that your sales rep brings to the table. New bright ideas. Every single person in an organization is on the sales team, whether they want to admit it or not. Yeah, I think everybody should have a quota, but I've obviously lost that fight a lot of times in my career too. Yeah, but don't give up because that really is a good fight. <laughs> oh, I'll never give up on that one because I do believe everyone's in sales, just like you said. Yeah, everybody is because, you know, I mean, I've actually heard people, I'll never forget a fellow that I worked with many, many years ago. His name was Ken. One of my customers actually said, make no mistake about it. Ken calls me and he's looking for money every time he calls me. What a pleasure it is to talk to him about giving him my money. And that was just shocking to me. He was a finance guy. He was actually a collector. And he was looking for money, but he made it pleasant and he made it a happy experience. Every time that particular customer, who was a very large account, I never fell behind in his bills because he knew that and would call him and really give him that conversation that you don't want to have with anybody. But he always looked forward to the conversations that he did have to have because he was so pleasant about it. Ken collected millions and millions of dollars from this. Yeah, you know, that, that that's a whole episode in itself, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've seen so many customer relationships lost, frankly, by collections, right? And, and, and a lot of times they just don't have the skill skills or the training or the mindset uh, that it is a business relationship. They're just cranking a number. Um, so it's nice to hear about a different version of that. Right. Absolutely. But it does go to show and everybody should always remember that regardless of your, whether you are the janitor or the CEO, you are in sales when it comes to your company's customers. After all, every single person in the company is responsible for those customers and owns those customers collectively. Yep. That's right. They are the company's customers and everybody has that responsibility. Exactly. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change topics here a little bit on you. I'm going to talk sure. a little bit about preparation. In the intro, we talked about how you were a key team leader in a global software deployment, right? A pretty complicated one, a whole bunch of countries. With that, what did you learn as part of the process in terms of preparation? Be over-prepared, absolutely, and expect every disaster you could possibly, in your wildest dreams, expect, which was my personal experience. 
we prepared for something like, I don't know, four or five years to do this rollout that we did. And we prepared the teams, uh, all sorts of different teams. It wasn't just sales teams, it was finance teams, it was you know, warehouse teams, it was sales teams, obviously. But we prepared people to run parallel systems. We prepared them to be uncomfortable. We prepared them with alternate methods of being able to communicate to their customer with one constant underlying theme. And that was your customer is not to know that there was a change in your system. How do you prepare somebody to be uncomfortable? Well, uproot everything that they know and we automatically make them uncomfortable. So just by virtue of the fact that we were changing their system right before their very eyes, we made them uncomfortable. And some of the most senior people I've ever worked with were squirming in their chairs. So it's just a matter of mentioning, even just casually mentioning that you're going to make a change to something and you have instantly, for most people, brought a level of discomfort. Okay. You mentioned just about every department in that transition, right? You worked with warehouse, you worked with finance, you worked with sales. I'm sure you worked with marketing, though they didn't get a specific call up. And everything else in between from a product management organization to supply chain. How does being asked to participate in a company-wide initiative as a salesperson make you more successful? It absolutely makes you more successful. You are correct because, you know, you've got this feeling as did all of those other departments. And you're right. I did also work with the marketing department. It's shame on me for not calling them out separately. Sorry about that, marketing people. <laughs> but each person that was called, in my case, each person that was called to the table from each of those different departments really felt that they had something special to offer because their department was the most special and the most, the, the one that was going to be disrupted the most, et cetera, et cetera. They were also given the, um, I hate to use this expression, but we empowered them to feel powerful, to take the information that we were teaching them and training them with, take it back and be the thought leader and be the person that was going to bring their teams on board. Because after all, there's a finite number of people who are going to do this, right? So you've got to have the people who were involved really in the trenches be able to disseminate that information to the next group of people who can give it to the next group of people and to the next group of people, et cetera, until the whole company is encompassed into the same program. So enabling those people and empowering those people to be able to be the person that their peers looked up to made all the difference in the success of the program. And believe me, there were plenty of people along the way that were asked to be successful elsewhere because they couldn't step up and really take one for the team and be that person to put in the extra time and to put in the extra thought and to frankly put in the extra energy that it took knowing that we were going to be changing their lives, the lives of their customers, the lives of everybody, their families even, and everybody around them while all of this was going on. So picking those people and making the adjustments to the having the correct people um, was really quite an art and a science simultaneously. So with that, customer service, right? It's one, it's one of the things your teams, when I worked with you, were always amazing at. They were always so well coached at. You hold people to a standard, and I know this for a fact because I've been your customer, I've been your peer, right? You hold people to a standard that's very rare in business today. So when you think back to productivity or look at productivity today, and you look at a customer service department, what are things those folks can do that are live on the line with the customers? You know, and customers are reaching out with problems or questions. You know, how can they better organize their day? Well, that's a killer because in the customer service department, that's a great question because I tell you what, customer service is where um, everything seems to get dumped when nobody else knows what to do with it. So as a result, the customer calling with an order or they're calling with a problem or they're calling with a question or they're calling with, you know, they need a specification on something or they need their handheld or, or, you know, a million different things. That customer service rep needs to be in their arsenal. They have to have everything that they need to be able to answer all of those types of questions. One of the strongest things that a really great customer service rep will do, number one, they won't falter. They'll st stick to the top. But more than that is once they have made sure that the customer is satisfied in the, for the reason that they called, they will always ask just one more simple question. 
whether it be something like, um, I'm glad I was able to help you. Is there anything else that I can do for you? Or, hey, have you heard about, you know, whatever your next great thing is or an event that's coming up or something? They always leads, have one more question to ask and they always leave the customer wanting more from you. Nice. We want to be successful keys, I think. And okay. The good old fashioned, and this is something that I think is very, very lost, and I am extremely passionate about proper manners. Talk about Not that. This, yeah, well, it's very important. This is something that has truly gotten lost. You know, we've become so digital, so it's very easy to abbreviate a sentence, or and now we're starting to talk in abbreviations. I find myself very guilty of that, actually. We need to just step back a little bit and remember that and remember all the things that we learned in kindergarten and that our parents taught us let's treat people the way we want to be treated let's be respectful and let's be polite good old-fashioned manners please and thank you thanks so much for calling i hope the rest of your day is awesome go such a long way for somebody i actually had this experience earlier this week in my day job, I'm covering for somebody that, that is um, out of the office on an extended leave. And one of his customers called me just out of the blue for no particular reason, except she called me to tell me that I was a breath of fresh air. Well, they burst out laughing because I can't tell you that a lot of people call me a breath of fresh air. But more than that, this particular customer, I hadn't spoken, I mean, I didn't really know her. It just, just happened that I'm covering for this account. And I've been doing so for about three weeks, but I had a question or something for her. So instead of using digital media to contact her, I did the unthinkable and I picked the phone up. She was so stunned that I called her instead of using an email or a text to communicate with me, with her. She called me a breath of fresh air for that. I was very shocked by that. It's it reminded me you learn that, when you talk to people, isn't it? It, it? Well, she was really dumbfounded that I called her. And it reminded me that that is now what's going to set the best of the best apart. Be the person that picks the phone up. Have that live conversation. Ask that one extra question. It's easier to do it when you're on the phone than it is through your text or through your fingertips. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to go with, we're going to bring this to a close here, but I'm going to ask you a question. It has three parts to the answer. So just kind of be ready. You ready? Yeah. We wrote a book called The Unnatural Salesperson, and it's because you and I believe that the stereotype associated with a typical salesperson doesn't really fit. Neither you or I are in those molds, and most of the top performers that I've known in my career, frankly, aren't the glad-handing type A types. They're pretty serious people, and they have every personality under the sun. You've developed talent in hundreds of people over the course of your career, so tell me about three of the most non-traditional type people and their personality traits, and you don't have to name them, you can speak in generalities, that you help develop in the top performers. I've got one right in my mind, so I want to see if they're on the list, frankly. Really? Yeah. Uh, I can think of one fellow who was so technical, he talked over everybody's head, and he was brilliant with technology. I had to teach him how to speak at the level of a human being. That was kind of cool. And he has gone on to do really tremendous things with his, his career. He could sit and listen to a new technology and take it back within minutes and pitch it to a customer. And then we helped him to be able to pitch it in such a way that the customer could actually understand what he was saying. The guy was so smart, he couldn't get out of his own way. He turned out to be an award-winning, consistently award-winning, overachieving salesperson, which is really neat. Only problem with him was he couldn't get himself organized. It was always scattered and just a mess. And it ultimately cost him his job, which was kind of sad. Yeah. And that's, that's a big part of why we're building some of the things we're building is to help people so they can have those skills. Exactly. Absolutely. Because this guy could have gone on. I mean, I, I kind of lost touch with him, unfortunately, but he was, he was, it was remarkable that he could take technology and just break it down to human understanding it was really cool experience actually okay so that's one what about another one and then i had another guy very dear he turned out to be a very dear friend of mine this guy could dial for dollars better than any human being i've ever met in my life he would work an eight hour day and he was on the phone for nine of those eight hours <laughs> that was really cool i never met anybody who loved to die he just loved to hear people tell him no 
because he would figure out more reasons to call that person back to get them to say yes. It's pretty remarkable. That was really cool. I actually wrote about that person without naming them not long ago in the power hours. Yep. It's yep. really cool. Yep. It's something yep. I, I still do and I still teach to this day. Yep. It's pretty cool. And, 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 and who, who would be your third? Oh, who would be my third? That would have to be my old pal, Chris. My God, what a salesperson he turned out to be. Very analytical and a very unassuming guy that really wasn't comfortable talking to really anybody. And he turned out to be one of our super, super salespeople because we were able to bring him out of his shell. It took a while and it took a few different approaches and it took some uh, less than conventional means to get him to feel comfortable but we actually got him to be really comfortable speaking in front of very large groups and speaking one-on-one -on -one to people. And that was really a challenge because this man, he was a man, very, very uncomfortable in that environment. And he, he has gone on to have an incredible, lucrative, successful career as a result of the coaching that he had way back in the day. Nice. So I'll actually, you didn't name the person I'm thinking of. So you introduced me to a young woman. It's probably almost 20 years ago now when we were in a meeting in Denver and she was so shy, she could barely look up from her shoes. And she was on your team at the time. And actually, I know for a fact that she's still one of the, if not the top performer at her company. And she developed into such an incredible professional Literally, she'd be on my short list anywhere I ever went as someone I'd want to take with me. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. She did go on to do great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Very she's successful she's, career. You're right. Yeah. And, and amazing, right? Beyond the business world. She's she's built an amazing life for herself, you know, and, and it's really makes me happy to think about. It. Yeah. You know, it's funny when I look back over the years now and I'm, I'm still in contact with many, many people that I coached over the years. And a lot of my former co-workers, because um, I was with the company that you and I worked with, I was there for over 20 years, obviously. So I, I saw a lot of people come and go. But it really is nice to step back now at this, at this phase of my career and to really see all of the careers, frankly, that I had a handle in. And it's pretty neat. Yeah, it's really <laughs> nice to see. Between careers and customers, it really is not a bad life. No, it's truly not. And I've had a good one. Dorinda, thank you so much for being here. I know we're going to have you back a couple more times. You know, we're going to talk about some other things. You know, for those of you that are listening, again, you can check out the bonus material on the website. Dorinda's writing an article, you know, that is going to be 10 things that will get you more organized and make you more efficient that she's going to go into some depth on. We'll link to that here in the show notes. And thank you so much again for your time. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much. This, this series has been phenomenal. And I know that there's a lot of great things coming down the pike that everybody is really going to benefit from. So thanks, Tim. Thanks for doing all this work. Appreciate nah, it. My pleasure. It's my passion. Absolutely. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thanks again for listening. And we hope you've enjoyed this episode. We put out fresh content every Tuesday. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, tell your friends, and share on your own social media accounts. Want us to see what you have to say? It's a BYOB kind of party. Bring your own bow tie. So hashtag bring your own bow tie. Our listeners are important to us. After all, it's you we create this content for. With that in mind, we're doing a mailbag episode once a quarter. If you have suggestions, ideas, or questions you'd like answered, email us at mailbag at bowtiesandbusiness.com. This show is produced, edited, and researched by Courtney Kubiak with the help of her rescue dogs, Tequila Rose and Rooney.